in the next 40 minutes, um, I'm going to show you how to build a simple remote control robot with automotive grade Linux. My name is Leona Navi. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Consalco Group. Consalco is an um, open source embedded software services company. We specialize in system architecture, development, building, maintaining upstream uh, open source projects such as automotive grade Linux. So today we already had two talks about automotive grade Linux in this very room. At uh, the beginning of the day, Walt Miner gave us an overview of uh, automotive grade Linux, the new stuff that we get there. It was a great talk, Walt is over there. And uh, after that, my colleagues from Consalco Group, uh, Scott Murray and Matt Porter, gave another talk which was more specialized. So today, as uh, now, today I'm going to present you AGL in a little bit different angle. The agenda for this talk uh, contains a brief overview of automotive grade Linux. After that, um, I'll speak about the supported hardware in AGL and how we can use this hardware uh, with some peripheral devices to build a different product. It's, a, let's say, a toy. Uh, later on, I'll explain how to do integration and contribution of uh, software to automotive grade, uh, grade Linux. Finally, we'll have some time for making conclusions and, of course, question and answers at the end of the talk. Although the title of the talk says that uh, we are going to build a robot, this is not the main purpose of this talk. The main, the main purpose of this talk is uh, to do an experiment, an experiment to find out if other industries can benefit from the features existing, of out, uh, existing in automotive grade Linux. If you're building uh, Internet of Things, connected devices, there are certain requirements if you want to run Linux on them. You require from the Linux distribution uh, to have a build system and a whole development tool chain. You require a certain security level it's nice to have over-the-air updates. And of course, for certain devices, uh, you need a graphical stack and applications if there is a user interface that is on a display for the users. Doing all this from scratch can take a lot of time. And on the market, there are a lot of open source Linux distributions which um, cover these requirements. One of these uh, Linux distributions is actually automotive grade Linux. So in the next few slides, we'll see how automotive grade Linux fits into this. How many of you are familiar with automotive grade Linux? Can you raise your hands if you have been involved somehow? Are you developing f applications or platform developers with automotive grade Linux? OK. So I hope that um, I'll inspire you contribute more code and to use more automotive grade Linux. Automotive grade Linux is a project of the Linux Foundation. Um, it's, um, it was created to, pro to provide in vehicle infotainment GNU Linux distribution for the automotive industry. It's already based on top of um, popular open source projects such as the Yocto project and Open Embedded. Automotive grade Linux was um, found, uh, found in, uh, founded in 2014, and in the past three years, there is a tremendous um, progress. A lot of companies are contributing to automotive grade Linux. If I'm honest, these are not all of the companies. I didn't have enough, time, enough uh, space on the slide to fill in on the, uh, all the company, companies. A lot of people are contributing to AGL. AGL is having a six months release cycle. Um, if you notice the dates, uh, you can see that every six months we have a new release. Currently, the stable release is Darling DAP. Uh, oh no. yep. Darling DAP over here. And um, now we're working on the next release, Electric EU, which is scheduled for December uh, 2017. And actually, the first release candidates are already available. 
Um, this six months release cycle is pretty much following what is happening in the Yocto project. So we try to, to be up to date with the Yocto project. Let's have a look at um, the architecture of automotive grade Linux, uh, the core technologies that we have there. Um, it's obviously a Linux distribution, so we need a Linux kernel. It's, um, it's a Linux distribution that is built with security in mind since day one. Uh, so we have uh, security based on SMAC and Sinara. This is something that uh, you might be familiar with from other projects, such as Tizen. There is application framework. Um, and uh, on top of this, we have systemd, dbus, and um, we have a me mechanism for doing software over the air updates. Um, there is a sort of client called Actualizer, which is integrated with a um, popular open source tool for doing binary diffs and shipping these diffs to the embedded devices on which AGO is running. Uh, it's called OS3. You might be familiar with it from the project called Gnome Continuous. On top of this, uh, we have a graphical user stack, which is relying on the Wayland protocol and the Western Compositor, which is a reference system of the Wayland protocol. Um, the user interface, as of the moment, if you build the default target of AGL, uh, contains a bunch of really nice looking Qt and QML HMI applications. Furthermore, AGO supports HTML5, GStreamer, and a lot of other technologies. As I already said, automotive grade Linux relies on the Yocto project and Open Embedded for building the whole distribution. Um, this means that automotive grade Linux incorporates a lot of different layers, meta layers, fr from the Yocto project, uh, such as Pocky, the reference system of the Yocto project and a lot of specific projects that bring features that are specific for AGM. Um, I listed a few of those layers, not all of them. Keep in mind that we have a bunch of board support package layers for all the hardware that we're support, supporting in AGL. Just a brief look at what is supported in AGL. We have support for Renaissance Generation 3 and Generation 2 boards. Keep in mind that we're speaking about an automotive Linux distribution, so um, the supported hardware devices are devices that are heavily used in the automotive industry. We, uh, AGO also runs on Intel devices, on Texas Instruments uh, um, platforms, such as the Vio board, on Dragon board, on Raspberry Pi 2 and 3, uh, Raspberry Pi is a community-supported board. And since a few days, it also works on IMX6, Sabre and Hummingboard. Hummingboard is the latest addition to the supported hardware platforms by, by automotive grade Linux. This is a screenshot. So over here is a screenshot of the home screen of um, automotive grade Linux. Let's have a look at the tool chain that uh, we have for development. All projects within automotive grade Linux are hosted in Git. Um, the Garrett is used for managing um, and reviewing code. We have Jenkins for continuous integration and furthermore testing some of the changes automatically. There is a Jira where you can file issues by reporting bugs or requesting new features. There is a wiki article, and there is a new documentation site where you can find docs how to get started with the exact steps. So with this, the short overview of AGO is over, and now um, I'll move to something more practical, and uh, it's um, the experiment how to build a remote control robot. So in order to do this, and we're speaking about a hobby project that any one of you can do during the weekends, that's what I did, actually. Um, so we're speaking about low-cost hardware that you can buy from 
uh, you can buy easily. You need a single board computer. Obviously, this has to be a single board computer from the list of hardware devices that we mentioned, because we already know that AGL works on them. You need um, a chassis and a DC motor. If you're good with 3D printing, you can construct your own chassis. If you want, you can buy uh, some of the existing robot chassis that you can find around the internet or in, or in eBay. You need a motor driver to drive the DC motors, a few sensors to make things more interesting, and of course you need batteries to um, run all these. So those of you who know me before the talk know my choice. I'm a Raspberry Pi fan, especially when we're speaking about hobby projects. So for this experiment, I decided to rely on Raspberry Pi 3. Um, I believe all of you know Raspberry Pi pretty well. It's a very affordable, a lot of people have it. Uh, it has a good software support in general, as well as uh, automotive-grade Linux. There, there are a variety of uh, add-on boards that you can easily plug on the Raspberry Pi in order to build um, a robot or another hobby project. And there is a huge community. Um, one important remark, this is not an automotive-grade board, so it doesn't um, cover certain requirements, and it's good for hobby projects. And keep in mind that this experiment is in this category. Uh, the good thing about Raspberry Pi, actually, how many of you have Raspberry Pi? OK, uh, all of you. That's perfect. I hope you understand my choice. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of people are building remote controls uh, robots with Raspberry Pi. It's a nice toy. Even a child can build it. And there are a lot of motor controller uh, add-on boards that you can just buy, plug on top of the 40 pins of the Raspberry Pi, and get things working. Um, I have listed some of the popular um, add-on boards that you can buy. Here you see the exact, micro, uh, the, the exact controller that they're using. As you can see, uh, I have nailed down just a, f um, just a few of them. Um, I decided to do not to use the one that I can buy, but actually to make my own do-it-yourself uh, motor driver board. This took me a bit of time. I'm not very good at soldering, as you can see. Um, I had a look at the few popular half-H motor drivers that I already saw that are being used by other, other boards, such as the ones that I showed on the previous slide. Um, I decided to select one from Texas Instruments that is the easiest one for soldering, this one over here. This is how it looks. As I said, I'm a software engineer, not very good with soldering, as you can see, but it works. Um, you need, um, it, it controls two DC motors. You need an external battery pack uh, to power this thing and to make it run. So now controlling the motors. Um, so the problem with Raspberry Pi is that we don't have enough uh, hardware PVM. Uh, there is just a single one of them, and this is kind of a problematic, because if you, if you want to have a good control of the motors, um, you need to rely on hardware PVM. Uh, it, alternatively, we can emulate so with software the PVM, but um, the results are not that good. They're good enough for making a simple demo, but if we want to go one step further to make it more interesting, it's better to pick up a microcontroller with PVM and to have a hardware control over the PVM. Um, there is a popular open source library called Wiring Pi, uh, which is very convenient for integration with um, C and C++ projects. Um, and it can uh, emulate PVM from the software side. So these are super cheap, dirt cheap. Motor, um, um, motors with wheels. You can buy them uh, from eBay for one or two US dollars. It's absolutely nothing. Of course, you need to wait for quite some time for their arrival. But uh, if you find them in a local store, just get them. Get them. They're really useful for, uh, for making this hobby projects. Uh, so my idea for the robot is to have just uh, two, three wheels, two of them to control, and one um, additional wheel. And uh, this is a very simple code box just to show how simply with wiring pi 
I can enable the software emulation of the PVM and uh, to make these motors move uh, forward or backward. So let's have a look at the sensors. When you're building um, a hobby robot, there are a bunch of sensors that you can use. Probably the most popular that I have seen in a lot of projects, almost all projects, is the ultra sonic sensor for measuring distance towards objects. Um, this is um, a cheap and effective sensor that uh, allows you to measure the distance with, um, to walls, for example, or other obstacles, and to make a simple algorithm to move around them. Um, another fun, fun thing is that actually I didn't, di uh, I haven't done this yet on my robot, but it's a uh, infrared line tracking. So basically, the idea there is with this sensor, uh, you can distinguish, uh, for example, a, um, a black line, and your robot can follow the line. So it's a path-following robot. Um, other cool sensors are like the the compass that you can find as an I squared C sensors. There are other I squared C sensors for measuring temperature, humidity, colors, lights, so you can even distinguish the ambient light. Um, furthermore, Raspberry Pi has um, official Raspberry Pi camera coming from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which you can also integrate within, uh, within the robot. The integration is pretty simple because um, there is a board support package layer called Meta Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's uh, for the Yocto project in general, as well as to other Linux distributions such as automotive-grade Linux, which are based on the Yocto project and open embedded. Since we're building a um, robot that has to be remotely controlled, um, we have to think about the communication. And in terms of communication, Raspberry Pi has built in Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and Bluetooth. Uh, it's very easy to extend the capabilities of Raspberry Pi by adding um, radio transmission models, uh, modules or infrared receiver and or transmitter. In our case, it's uh, enough to add a receiver. And uh, of course, um, we can buy some GSM modules and even control um, the robot this way because Ophono is built in in automotive grade Linux. Um, this is an example of how, how you can Add to your do-it-yourself board. Actually, this is what I did um, to add an infrared receiver. These are schematics that I took from another project that I'm having. Um, it's a very popular infrared receiver, which uh, can be easily integrated as um, add-on board for on add-on boards for Raspberry Pi, and um, receive commands using the Linux Infrared Remote Control project, or known as LIRC. It's a 20 years old project that, it's, uh, that works perfectly fine on Linux. So putting all this together um, on a Raspberry Pi, on, on top of Raspberry Pi requires making a do-it-yourself board. I'm currently working on it. I already have the prototype soldered on a breadboard prototyping. The next step would be to design this board on a KiCad. Um, this is my setup. Uh, I'm using um, I, I'm using these pins, uh, general purpose input output pins for attaching the DC motors. I need uh, four pins for this with wiring Pi as explained in the previous slide. I'm emulating uh, uh, so software really the PVM. The infrared is attached over here. This is actually the, uh, ha the only hardware uh, PVM pin that I have on the Raspberry Pi. I also uh, keep the UART for easier debugging of the board. And of course, I, squ I squared C sensors for attaching the sensor that I've explained on the previous slides. So getting back to the software side of things, uh, here is how we build automotive grade Linux. It's a very straightforward process. Um, it's very easy to do it. You just have to follow the exact steps, which are explained actually in two places. One of the places is the AGA wiki. The second uh, one is the official documentation. So the process has three major steps. Um, first, you have to get the source code. As you can see from the commands over here, um, AGL is using the uh, Google re repo tool to, uh, to keep together all the um, layers for building the distribution. 
Um, when, if you want to use a specific version of um, automotive grade Linux, this is where you have to specify this version. In general, the way I have written it here, I'm going to use the AGL master. This is the currently um, the, the current branch of AGL that is being in develop. So this is the cutting edge. Um, if you want to rely on something more stable, because you know when when we are using the master branch, there. The, there is a development going on, so something might not work as expected. But if you want to use something stable, make sure that you are using the latest stable ver version of AGL, for example, Darling DAP, as of the moment. After that, we have to set up the build environment. And here comes the interesting part, because with uh, these magical words here, we can activate or deactivate certain features available in automotive-grade Linux. Um, for my remote, com uh, remote control robot, I, I don't plan to add a display. And since there is no, no display on it, I really don't need uh, the whole graphical stack. So what I'm building here is the very, very simple, the very basic automotive grade image, uh, which um, is um, convenient for headless devices as the one that I'm building right now. One more thing to say, you need, a, you need a Linux machine to run these procedures, or uh, uh, it's possible to do it in a virtual machine as well, but it will take quite a lot of time. Um, the build of the, this Linux distribution will take some time, so p please be passionate. Grab a cup of, to uh, cup of coffee while you're waiting. Um, let's have a look at the three most commonly used automotive-grade Linux images. The first one is the one that I, I'm actually using for this project, AGO Image Minimal, the bare minimum of, uh, minimum of automotive grade Linux. The, the other one is IVI. Uh, IVI stands for In Vehicle Infotainment. And finally, we have the AGL Demo Platform. Uh, the AGL Demo Platform is the image uh, that provides the whole demo UI uh, shipping with automotive grade Linux as of today. You have a bunch of demo applications, uh, a home screen with a bunch of um, demo applications. All these uh, demo applications of, as of today are uh, written in Qt. Uh, they're running on top of Wayland and Weston, and Weston is relying on IVI shell to, uh, to render. So how to customize the, the, the image? Um, the way to customize it is actually uh, straightforward. If you're familiar with the Yocto project and Open Embedded, you already know how to do it. Um, there are two key files that you would like to edit while you're working, still working on the on the product. The first one is called BB Layers. It contains the list of the Yocto layers within the distribution, and the second one is called conf/local.conf, where you can customize what exactly to get into the image, and um, in this example over here, I'm adding Lyric. This is um, the software that I need to, to, to scan and control the robot through infrared. Uh, keep in mind that Lyric is provided by Meta Open Embedded Layer, and this layer is already available in uh, automotive grade Linux. Therefore, I have not described it um, in BB layers because it already exists. Uh, for example, if you're working on another project that uh, requires another another uh, software which is provided by um, a layer that doesn't exist in uh, automotive grade Linux as of today, you have also to describe, you need to describe the, the layer in BB layers. Um, this is a quick and dirty way to add new packages really quickly, but if you want to build a, f uh, a new distribution based on automotive grade Linux, uh, a new product, the better way is to do the full integration, to do your own Yocto recipes, and finally, to have your um, image based on, on top of AGO. This is how you're customizing the image just quickly during development. So um, I would like to spend just a few slides for speaking about how to contribute to a uh, AGO upstream. So the first step, if you want to add a new project or a new feature within automotive grade Linux is to report an issue in Jira. Uh, you need um, an account for Linux Foundation to log in into the Jira. It's super easy to create one. 
uh, you can request a new feature, report a bug that you have experienced, and once you have this listed, the next step is um, you or someone else to modify the source code of AGL and to contribute it to to gear it. It's um, it's not mandatory, but it, it's nice to include the Jira ID within the git commit message that will appear in gear it. This is um, easier. Uh, this is a um, good option to continue tracking the progress of this bug within uh, Garrett and the Git commits. Have you used uh, Garrett? How many of you are familiar with it? Okay, I would rather say half of the people around here. So Garrett is an um, open source, web-based team code collaboration tool. Um, it's, uh, first of all, it's for a number of Git uh, repositories. Um, it's written in Java. It's available under open source license, Apache license, actually. Um, so here is how you can create this account and get started with Garrett and Jira, actually, in AGL. Here is the workflow of Garrett. So uh, we have one major repository. For, for example, here we have AGL repo. This is um, the, the repository that holds the manifests uh, for uh, the a Google uh, repo tool that um, keeps all the layers needed to build automotive grade Linux. So if we want to make a change, for example, to bump the version of a certain layer, to add a new layer, or to remove a layer, uh, we have to pull this into a developer repo on our local machine. After that, we have to make some changes and to push them back to Garrett. Uh, this is, uh, Garrett is going to create a repository where the pending changes are uh, the, 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 where the changes are pending for a review. Um, there is um, there are three type of roles in, within Garrett. One are the developers, the people doing the the push and pull from Garrett uh, from um, from Garrett to uh, from the sorry from the official Garrett repository to the one that's pending the reviews. The second role are the reviewers. They can be, again, developers. They have to fetch, test your changes, and give their opinion. They can vote with plus or minus. Uh, if you have enough positive votes, the maintainer, the third row, should merge your change within um, the official repository by doing a submit. All right. So you're welcome to um, Automotive Grade Linux at any time. We have a mailing list. I highly encourage you to subscribe. We have a weekly developer call that Walt is doing every Tuesday. And uh, we have an RC channel. We're at the end of the presentation, so I would like to do a few conclusions. So according to my experience, open source is compressing the development cycle for a faster route to the market. And I think this is um, a great benefit for the whole ecosystem, because this way you can make your products faster and provide them with better quality, because open source means that more and more people are looking into the source code and um, are putting efforts to get it better. Um, AGL is based on, on top of already proven open source software technologies. We mentioned them uh, during the presentation, like the Yocto project, Open Embedded, um, uh, Wayland, Western, and uh, Qt, and so on. I won't uh, list them all now. Again, so AGO is entirely open source project, so don't hesitate to contribute to it. Um, it offers an open source software stack, which can be useful not only for the automotive industry, but for certain cases if you're doing Internet of Things. Uh, I hope that my experiment with this uh, simple remote control robot proves uh, that's possible to do it. Uh, you have already seen how to do integration within AGL if you're developing a, another project on top of it. So what's next? In terms of my own hobby project for the robot, I need to, to do um, a better board that is uh, designed in KiCad, a two-layer board on which I'll put all the components as I explained them in the previous slide to get it more professionally working. Um, in terms of AGL, the next steps are releasing a stable final version of Electric EO. This is going to be the next release of AGL, and this, is, this, has to be, uh, this has to happen by the end of this year, and hopefully 
uh, to have um, nice uh, presentations for the Consumers Electronics Show uh, next year. Starting as of uh, January 2018, um, we should start developing the next release of AGO, which is called Funky Founders. That's, this is the name of a fish. The code names of, um, of AGO are actually names of fishes. We have to, to say big thanks to Walt, who found in alphabetical order names of all those fishes. So the sixth release of um, AGO is Funky Founders. Thank you very much for um, joining this presentation. Uh, we have like five or six minutes for doing some uh, Q&A session, and I have listed here a few interesting links. So thanks, and any questions? Yep. <laughs> ah, the robot. Well, the, the problem is that um, I still don't have the whole robot built, and I don't bring it over here, but um, as soon as I design the, the board in, within KiCad, uh, I'll show it, it with it uh, the whole as a whole robot, and hopefully it will be working better than the mo at the moment because <laughs> it was not in that good shape, and I left it at home. Yes. Okay, so if I hear well the question, is is there any uh, specific advantages of using automotive-grade Linux for hobby projects such as this one instead of using Raspbian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yes, for hobby projects you can also uh, uh, use Raspbian. The process is similar. Um, the advantage of using automotive-grade Linux is more for projects that are also targeting um, some um, long-term um, relationship and even going to, to the market because um, Raspbian is a Debian-based distribution with desktop. When you do a headless device like this robot, you don't actually need the whole graphical user interface like X11 that is shipped within Debian. Uh, while automotive-grade Linux with a headless profile can be more flexible for, for the needs of, um, of a project that doesn't require a display, for example. If you want to do, um, so um, if, you, if you want to do um, another device with graphical user interface similar uh, to what we have in the cars, automotive grade Linux can also be useful for that. Yes, over there. Uh, sorry, could you please repeat it a little bit louder? Okay, so the question is how large is, is the system image of automotive grade Linux? I'm not exactly sure in terms of um, megabytes how large is this. Um, well, do, do you know exactly how big is it? Yes, I, I also don't remember, but I, I believe it's uh, below, uh, the, the final image should be around 200 megabytes, but take my words with a pinch of salt, I'm not exactly sure about the size. You can optimize it if, you, if you're searching for a s smaller size. Just for a reference that you can build a pocky image that is like 30 megabytes or something like that. Yes? Um, okay, so the question is, what is the boot time of AGL on Raspberry Pi 3? Um, I also don't have the exact number in seconds. It depends on the profile. The AGL uh, minimal image boots pretty fast. Uh, with the graphical user interface, it could take, for example, like uh, 10 seconds or something like that. It depends on the how, how fast and which uh, Qt applications will be loaded as part of the, uh, the demo image. Okay, uh, one question over there. Okay, so the question is, I'll just repeat it. Uh, the question is regarding the licensing of Qt within automotive grade uh, Linux, and more specifically, uh, are the applications written with the uh, uh, open source license or if a proprietary license is required. Did I get it correct? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so the applications that we have as of today within the demo version of Automotive Grade Linux are under the open source license of Qt. Uh, if you require to use a proprietary uh, Qt applications and to ship them in AGL, you have to do it uh, as, as part of your own layer uh, because uh, AGL is an uh, open source distribution and uh, if you want to contribute something to the upstream, it has to be under an open source license. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for joining.